All right, everybody, it is another Thursday live stream here with Green with Envy, and the Boston Celtics have officially clinched the number one seed. So what comes next? We're here to talk about that. We still got six games left on the schedule, including the Kings on Friday night. We'll hit that. And then we'll also, we're also going to look ahead to some NBA awards because, like I said, Celtics have the number one seed with six games to go. Ain't much else left to do in the regular season. So let's start talking about some of the awards that come along with that number one seed. So we're going to get into all of that and more. Make sure you're coming in. You got some questions. Drop them in the chat. This is Green with Envy. Let's lock in. What up, what up, what up? Welcome into another edition of Green with Envy. It is a Thursday live stream, and the Celtics are officially the number one overall seed in the NBA. This is your boy, Will. We are checking in. How you doing? How you living? Joining me today, my best friend, co-host, and the coach of our podcast, the one and only, Greg Manakis. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. Beautiful day. Uh, here in Austin, Texas, and Celtics number one seed. I actually haven't watched the uh, the second half of the Thunder game last night because we had our own men's league game. Yep. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing that actually after this uh, after this recording. Yeah, man. So last night was was pretty crazy. So as you mentioned, we had a men's game. So I caught the first half before our game. I, I watched the second half this morning, and you know, shout out to the Thunder. It the final score does not necessarily represent the first three quarters of that game. Because the first three quarters of that game was was pretty competitive. And obviously, given the fact no Jalen Williams, no SGA, it was going to be pretty tough for, for OKC to, to keep up. But they were hanging between, you know, it, it was fluctuating between 6 to 12 points. You know, they were in striking distance. And, you know, the Celtics were certainly taking advantage of, some advan of, of the advantages that they did have without those stars. But, man. Holy shit, that fourth quarter escalated quickly. When I when I woke up this morning and saw the Celtics won, or when we left our men's league game, I saw the Celtics won by 35. I was like, man, must not have missed much. This was a game that was just out of hand real quick in that second half. But it was in that fourth quarter, it turned on a dime, and the Celtics racked it up really quickly. Jalen Brown was a was a big part of that after having in underwhelming first three quarters looks like that hand might be bottom a little bit i'm just saying that's that's got to be something we'll talk about here in just a second that's, uh, yeah that's the story of the game yeah jalen brown i think uh joe brad if you guys are listening to this which you should be i don't know why you wouldn't be fans of the green with envy podcast we give really good advice we have really good things to say so make sure you're tuning in but please rest jalen brown these last six games please please rest him but celtics come away 35 point victory there i believe it's their 16th victory of 25 points or more this season which is equal to the total number of losses they have think about that for a second <laughs> they've won that's, that's 16 games stat. by 25 and they've lost a total of 16 greg let's you know let's just think about this season for a moment i want to it goes you know we don't always stop and smell the roses right we don't always stop and embrace what we have going on celtics have secured the number one overall seed here so all the way through the end of the playoffs home court advantage for the Boston Celtics in every playoff series they have. When you start to to think about this season, which, you know, has a week and a half left, you know, what, what do you think is going to stand out to you the most right now? In the moment, what do you think is going to stand out to you? Looking back on this season? Yeah, as of right now, what do you think you're going to remember, at least this regular season to this point? Because obviously the playoffs will ultimately determine how we remember the season, but just focusing on the regular season to appreciate it for a moment. Um, hmm, that's a great question. I think probably the addition of Porzingis and Holiday will probably stick out the most because that has truly unlocked another level to this team that we didn't really think was possible. You know, like to be able to flip Marcus Smart for Porzingis, to be able to flip two injury prone guys, although we love Rob Williams um, for right. Drew Holiday, just like out of nowhere. I think that's the thing that's really going to stand out to me is just how it's, sometimes you know, it's better to be lucky than good. And, you know, the way that everything came together for the Boston Celtics this year, because if that initial trade goes down where Brogdon is the one that shipped out, like who knows, who knows Dude, what's, who knows what happens. Like maybe we never end up with Drew Holiday because we're just like, we got Marcus Smart. We got we Marcus need... Smart. I, I, I would be shocked if we ended up with, with Drew Holiday. I mean, actually, no, it could still definitely be possible, but, there, but there's two major what ifs in that, right? Like what if the first trade, 
goes through and it's Marcus Smart, not, you know, that or it's excuse me, it's Malcolm Brogdon that goes out and Marcus Smart's here. And, you know, then there's the other what if of Celtics. I mean, there, there's a I was pretty excited about the Celtics team coming in with Porzingis when we thought about how big we had gotten when you have Rob, you have, you know, Porzingis, you have Horford. And, you know, Malcolm Brogdon was coming off sixth man of the year. Say what you will. Like, that's still a pretty good backcourt, right? When you have Derek White and, and Malcolm Brogdon and that front line, like now we we're, I think, feel a lot better with how Luke has performed as mm-hmm. that third big, you know, then getting Tillman at the trade deadline. But when you have Rob, who's a guy that has already been all defense and it's, it's just a matter of health, but obviously that's gonna be very scary when you mix in Porzingis' health, but that's a whole other version of this team that, Still would be pretty good, but be fun as hell, right? Like that would have been a fun team too. So it's just it's really fascinating to think about all of the what if timelines that you know that exist for for this team even before we get into the season. And go ahead, look, you're going to say something right there. Well, I'm just I'm I'm just thinking about all the other things that are going to stand out to me. You know, maybe ten years down the road. And I think long term, obviously, it's going to depend on whether or not the Celtics win a title. Right. But I think Joe Missoula's development year two and to see the massive change in his personality and his um, level of comfort coaching this team and really just owning that he is the coach of the Boston Celtics. Hopefully, this is something that we can look, you know, 10 years from now and be like, man, remember when we all just like weren't really sure about Joe Mazzulla and look at him now. So the same yeah. same thing with Spo when he first took over the heat, right? People just weren't sure, clamoring for Pat Riley to come down from the front office. Just like last year, people like Brad Stevens, like you're Brad, right just, there. Just go yeah, ahead, it's, man. It's like Brad, just like, you know, go from the the from the uh, press box to maybe like halfway down the aisle, then just keep making your way until you just get back into that coach's seat. Like that and was that, what everyone had in, had envisioned at one point last season and i just didn't imagine that joe mazula would get to this point where now that's what more i think the majority of people recognize that joe mazula is a pretty good coach in that you know last year i was really surprised that he was able to even like make it through last year with the level of scrutiny like he was going through it you know he he, like he was just getting put in through the ringer and and here's the thing like because especially today as the the hornets are now looking for a head coach charles lee rumored to be one of the top potential replacements and you know he's been he's been a highly um thought of assistant throughout the league as a sam cassell and you think about all the scrutiny that you're mentioning that joe missoula had and i think once we all took a step back from last season and really thought about like damn joe was kind of floating on his own and you know maybe maybe brad was trying to bring in some help like that's like to me like i've, I've said this throughout yeah, the Dan season i leaving last year heard a lot right like that's the one ding i have on brad over the last three ish seasons or whatever it's been that he's been um the you know been the head of basketball operations for the celtics is that and i'm not and i have no idea if he was trying and things just didn't work out i mean even jj reddick had, had talked about two different times when Missoula got hired that he tried to bring him in as a coach and JJ rebuffed. So obviously they were trying to do stuff, but not getting Missoula the coaching help and potentially not stepping up as an assistant, but then that does create friction. I know that that's, you know, that's not cut and dry. Like that to me was the one failure of Brad's tenure thus far as, as, as POBO. Right. And, you know, other than that, he has such a stellar record. Almost Mm -hmm. every move he's made, like the Derek White trade, which even at the time looked like a question mark, like, man, we gave uh, basically a first round pick in, I think it's going to be 2028 or so. Now you look at it. I mean, Derek White was almost an all-star. He's getting love on the Zach Lowe podcast for the most improved player of the year award. He's likely about to make uh, an all NBA defensive team. We'll talk more about that later. And so that looks like a home run. The Al Horford trade has been huge. You look at, you know, obviously you just highlighted the Porzingis and the Drew Holiday trades, like, Brad's on fire here. And that's like the one thing that has always stood out. But now, and then what did he do to correct that? He went out and got Charles Lee, went out and got Sam Cassell. And now those guys are both going to be primed for potentially head coaching jobs. So I I think for Missoula having the growth and then also having now the infrastructure to allow him to grow, to be himself has been a huge, huge part of the season. Absolutely. So I'm going to throw the question back to you, like years down the road, what, what are you going to think is going to stand out to you from the season? What are you going to remember most? 
So I think there's there's two things. So right now, you know, as this this team is historically dominant, they're they're going to have a record that that's been you know whether they end up with you know 64, 65, 66 wins, whatever it's going to be. We've seen teams that that have had that. You know, the the 08, 09 Celtics were 66 wins, I believe, is 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 what they they finish with. And so right now they're tied for the second highest of all time net rating with 12.0. The only team they're t- they're tied with the 96, 97 Bulls. And the only team ahead of them is the 95, 96 Bulls at a 13.4 net rating. So to me, there's two consi- there's two themes. One is consistency, and one is dominance within that consistency. The Celtics this year have had six win streaks of five or more games and have never lost three straight. <laughs> That's like, and I mentioned even the other stats before about 20 winning games by 25 plus three wins of 50 points or more like to me that's what's gonna gonna stick out is the collective consistency and dominance with which this team has gone through this season and how you know despite you know obviously atlanta's still relatively fresh in people's minds despite the very small lulls that you you can find this team has shows up night in and night out on both sides of the ball and has been able to do it with you know, with consistency each and every time with a with a team that has been lucky to stay healthy. There's a little bit of luck that goes into that with with just staying relatively healthy. And outside of Porzingis, they've had health up and down the roster. And so to me, I think the the consistent dominance is what's going to stick out. Yeah. And then, the, you know, there's so many other things that you can point to. Like you mentioned Derek White and um, his rise to prominence amongst, you know, the the the. NBA media at large, I think, has finally accepted how great Derek White is. I think Celtics yeah. fans kind of always knew that he was the perfect connector. He was the perfect glue guy. But I, I think would that's say la- last year we realized that. his first half season. I think we were we weren't we were still trying to figure out w- who Derek White was. Because remember when he first came in, we <laughs> I still remember this uh, after the trade deadline. We were like, oh, I guess he's like kind of like Marcus Smart insurance. And then I think by the end of the first year, we were like, well, he's not as good as Marcus Smart. And then like halfway through last year, we were like, okay, maybe he's better than Marcus Smart. So there is like that that gathering, that that data gathering uh, time with, with Derek White as well. Right. And so Derek White's rise to prominence, I think, is another storyline that we'll always look back and, and remember um, Jalen Brown being worth the money. You know, right. That's a good that, one. That, that extension um, looks great right now. And Jalen... You know, it's it's really as we're saying, it's really going to come down to how they perform in the playoffs. But I I really feel like if we're healthy, we are going to win this title. And I think Jalen Brown, and you know me, I'm going to take my victory laps on JB all day, every day. Oh, yeah, and you should. His commitment to being a leader in the in the power leader vacuum, the absence of Marcus Smart, and him stepping up into that role, because we all knew Jalen Brown was a special guy, a special human being with his mm-hmm. work outside of the basketball court, right? Jalen Brown is is just like the perfect guy to lead the Boston Celtics franchise, just like out in the community. Jason Tatum's not so bad himself, right? But but Jalen Brown really coming into his own, like finding his voice, um, the confidence with which he speaks to the media, the accountability that he's showing, just no excuses made. He's like, we got to be better. We got to work on consistency and the the synergy between the coaching staff and the players and the, the messaging throughout. This is what a team feels like, right? A team that is like truly connected. And although we've had great teams in in the past, this is the first time we felt that like special electricity since you know, Doc Rivers and the 2007, 2008 Ubuntu team, right? You know, the ch- last championship team where it was like really, really special. You know, the new guys coming into the fold, a lot of parallels there because there's this new energy and everybody's ready to win at the same time. And I don't know that everybody was ready to win at the same time over the last couple of years. I mean, especially dating back to the Kyrie and Gordon right. Hayward years, right? So, like this year to win a championship, special things have to happen. And I think all of those things are falling into place. Now, fingers crossed, we can stay healthy in the playoffs. Fingers crossed. We don't draw just like a murderer's row to get to the finals because we all know we can get to the finals, but are we going to have enough in the tank to get through a Denver, to get right. through a Minnesota, to get through an OKC? Um, and, you know, that's really what it's going to come down to is can we take care of business like we haven't been able to in the past? So on that note, I do want to get to a question that we have in the chat here in one second, but I, I have a clip loaded up here. 
and you talked about kind of the growth of Jalen Brown and something that I think is making this team stand out. That's different from other versions of the of the J Celtics as you're as you're kind of talking here. I'm gonna play a clip. Tell me what you think Jalen Brown would have done either last year or in years prior in this clip. Richard out to Hauser. Brown the trailer. Spins on Giddy. Pristine passing. Cash out. Uh, what does Jalen Brown do in that same situation last year or, or the year before? Um, so it would either be a pull-up three. He'd just shoot the three, which I would have been okay with um, because that's a rhythm three walking into a three in transition. I'm okay with that shot. But then when he drives left and he gets shut off, but maybe he gets stripped of the ball and the ball just goes you know, up the other end for a transition basket. When he spins into the paint, maybe he shoots a floater. Maybe he tries to go through the contact. Um, maybe. Maybe he sees the he sees the corner man and throws it out for a three pointer, but probably an off target pass. And in the, in in this instance, the fact that he has the patience, he has the strength, he has the handle, and then he has the wherewithal to know, oh, there's a seven foot three sharpshooter right there on the wing, mm-hmm. which is something he realized from the very first game this year is that. You know, sometimes my passes are a little inaccurate, but it's a lot easier when you have a huge <laughs> yeah. freaking target to throw that ball. And I think that's one of the things with Porzingis that has really unlocked Jalen because he's not the most accurate passer. He's not the cleanest decision maker, but when you have someone who you can't miss on the court, it's a lot easier to get them the ball. Yeah. So that, that, that play I was looking through last night, some of the clips and I was like, this is a play number one. Cause I think when the Celtics are at their most deadly, the ball's moving side to side. They're getting pain touches. That pa- that play started with Peyton Pritchard in the paint. They swing the ball around the perimeter. Jalen Brown then dives, and he has two options. He could throw it to Derek White in the corner. He was also open. Throws it back to Chris Dapps Porzingis, and like you said, with that you know seven three seven four whatever Chris Dapps is, pretty hard to miss him. But there were about three or four different things that I could have expected Jalen Brown to do. Doesn't mean that they were the wrong, but I think once again, when this team is at their best, they're not just getting good looks; they're getting great. Looks. And that's what I think you you saw on, on that play there. But I want to pull up a question that we have here uh, in the chat. Southsiders. Um, our homie Southsiders in here. And so you started talking about this. Could any of these play-in tournament teams give the Seas any trouble? Philly's a dumpster fire, but Hawks just won twice. So could come with some confidence. And right now, just to set it up as to what the play-in tournament does look like as of right now. So right now, if the play-in tournament were to start today, it'd be the seven seed is the Pacers, the eight seed is the Sixers, nine seed Bulls, 10 seed Hawks. So it'd be seven verse eight, and then nine verse 10. The two uh, winner or the winner of nine ten would play the loser of seven eight for the right to play the Celtics. Uh, I will add in here that Miami and Indiana are basically in a virtual tie. So really, that and Miami place and spot, Philly break, uh, tonight or tomorrow? Exactly. I th- yeah, I think it's tonight as we're recording. So Thursday. So that could. So basically, that will potentially turn into a three team race. Philly definitely needs to win that game against Miami to turn this into a three team race for that six seed. So let's go to the question here, Greg. Could any of these play in play in tournament teams give the seeds any trouble? Well, well, and B do, just came back as well. That's the that's right. the biggest part of this. Trouble to me is not losing the series. Trouble is extending the series to six games or seven games where we're playing more minutes and more games. And we have to where every minute you're on the court, every game that the series gets extended is another opportunity to become unhealthy with a freak injury like we saw last year with Jason Tatum uh, Mm -hmm. spraining his ankle in game seven when the Celtics should have beat the Miami Heat just in five, six games. They just should have done it. They got down 3-0. I still can't believe that happened. But I think, you know, the the Hawks have a lot of talent. Um, They have a good coach. They have some players that are hard for the Celtics to guard. DeJounte Murray, one of the best isolation scorers and mid-range jumper jump shooters in, in the game, as we Don't saw. Let him take four. You gotta, gotta hold him under 44 shots. That's yeah, the- yeah, that's bad defense, guys. Bad defense. <laughs> can't let a guy shoot 44 times. It's insane um, but- that he shot 44 times, though. I still can't get over that. But they also have some guys that are just interesting. You know, they have Clint Capella, who's a beast. On he's the best offensive rebounder in the NBA. They've got Jalen Johnson, who's an absolute freak. He's been hurt right now. I'm not yeah. sure what his status would be in the playoffs, but um, he, I love Jalen Johnson. He was my my betting favorite for um, most improved player coming into the season. Um, they've got 
a Kongwu, another guy that I really, I really have liked in the past, hasn't quite lived up to the expectations, but I think he's another really interesting piece. They got Bogdanovich, who gives us problems. Trey Young can get hot at any time, so they have a ton of talent. Um, the Bulls, I don't really think they can give us any issues. I just, I, they also have talent, but I just think they don't match up well with the Celtics. Um, they don't really have guys that can give us that that many issues. I think we have the the right recipe to take them down now. Um, in the past, you know, the Bulls had we had issues guarding DeMar DeRozan and, and things of that nature but Levine being out you know I, I don't really take them seriously um and then obviously Philadelphia Indiana if that's what it ends up being right now if we see him beat in the first round um it's going to be fun it's a fun narrative I just don't think that Philly has the cohesion to beat us at this point mm -hmm. They, need, they needed a perfect season um, coming into the playoffs to beat the Celtics. I think they can give us issues. And I think Embiid would potentially be the best player in that series. Um, whereas every other series that you're looking at, if Jason Tatum is not the best player in that series, then that's a huge disappointment, right? Yeah. He should be better than Halliburton. He should be better than DeRozan. He should be better than Trey Young and DeJounte Murray, right? Jalen Brown should probably be better than all those guys as well. Hal Burton, um, dirty little secret, hasn't played well since coming back from that injury. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, not been a, it's not been great, yeah. Right, and he doesn't seem like the same guy without Buddy Heald. Buddy Heald, I think, unlocked a lot of what Hal Burton was able to do just with the spacing and all the ghost screening and blur screening that they do. So, um, trouble, I think the Hawks, because we just saw it, would probably, and we saw it last year as well, could be yeah. the team that could extend a series um, the furthest. I, I would imagine it's going to be Philly gets a seven seed and either Atlanta or Indiana get the eighth seed. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I, I just look at it as as pretty simply. Bulls, Hawks, if it goes more than four or five in those series, that's disappointing. Like, those need to be done in four or five. When you look at Philly and Indiana, I'd say six games. Is, it, it's really weird because we're parsing over one game and it's all of a sudden it's a very different feeling, but when you're trying to conserve energy and you're trying to make sure that you get to the finish line as whole as possible, those one games make a big difference, especially because when you look at the setup of the postseason, the first round is basically the only time you don't have a game every other day until you get to the finals. So that second and third round is pretty jam packed of just about every other day you're going to be playing first round. You're going to have probably at least two different times where you have two days off at some point. So if you sweep and, and say in the way that this is shaking out, like the Eastern Conference, it's going to be a bloodbath. I know all the records are sandwiched in there aside from the Celtics. Like you have the Bucks at the two seed with 47 wins and you get the Sixers with 41 wins at the eight seed. And they just got Embiid back. They've been without Embiid there or else they'd be, you know, in that 48, 50 win range, whatever they'd be. So you have an absolute bloodbath of teams that have to go through whatever their matchup is in the first round. So getting done in four or five versus going six or seven is a massive difference. So like I said, Bulls and Hawks, four or five, or it's very disappointing. I think both Philly and Indiana would have a chance to get to six games. Philly completely dependent on Embiid. Uh, I mean, he came back one game. I watched part of that game. It was, you know, he looked fine, but it's, it's the first game back, so I can't really judge too much. He got to the line 12 times. That's what he does. He gets, he gets to the free throw line. So I, I think for me, Indiana and Philly, if it gets to six, I'm okay. I'd rather it obviously be five. And, you know, Miami's still there. It could be in the play -in. I don't fucking know what to do with Miami, man. I like I, It's the same exact feeling I've had for three years. They shouldn't beat us. It shouldn't go more than – they should be in that Indiana – Philly category of this shouldn't go more than six. It should be a five or six game series. Yet we've just seen the ghost of the heat too many times that if there's any of those five teams that could push the Celtics to seven games, it's the heat. I don't think Indiana can push it to seven. I don't think Philly, honestly, unless it like, cause I just don't, I, I don't buy into MB being fully healthy. I just don't. I mean, we see it every we see it every postseason, and now he's coming off two and a half months or two months of of not playing, and he hasn't played with Buddy Heald and Kyle Lowry. He's gonna have four games before we get to the postseason to kind of figure out what it's like. I think if they had more time to gel, especially with Buddy Heald, I think that's a kind of terrifying uh, guy to play. Hey, can off I jump? Of can I jump TV. in real quick? Yeah, jump in. Fuck Kyle Lowry. <laughs> You've never liked Kyle Lowry. Then again, I I, he's he's pretty hard. To, like, listen, the guy's had a great career. He's so difficult to watch play basketball and be like, oh yeah, I enjoy this. This is fun. Like, shout out to S and all the Raptors that, fans dude. that will defend him to the death. 
I don't know how you guys lived through whatever it was, eight years of having to be like, yes, this is the basketball that we want and we want to root for. Granted, you guys got a championship out of it because you brought in Kawhi, but and I, don't Kyle, know how I mean, did. Kyle Lowry was great in the closeout game. He was, man. Knocked down all those threes. But yeah, I think to answer that question, I'm not worried about the Celtics losing to anybody. It's just, can we keep this to five games or under? That's like a really important for me in that first round is that we don't F around and waste minutes on Al Horford and KP and those that we just don't need to. So I think that's where I'm at with that. You know, real quick, Greg, before we go into just talking about the Kings game here, just for a little bit before we talk about some end of the season awards, you know, right now it's it's getting pretty interesting in that kind of two through five race in the in the Eastern Conference. The Bucks right now are at 47 and 29. They're a game and a half up on the Cavs. The Magic are surging. Yeah, They're only two hurt. games back. Games hurt. Yeah. I mean, they've lost what to the Wizards and the who the Wizards and the Grizzlies back to back, and their their docs blamed it on the equipment managers again. Equipment manager just getting strayed left and right from first Giannis, now from now from this, equi- this is this equipment manager just like going about his life, making jokes, being <laughs> friendly, bringing positive energy, and docs just like, why is this guy not taking his life seriously? I'm gonna see if I can find out who this guy is. I'm just I'm just gonna type in who is the Bucks equipment manager. Let's just see who it can be. But my point being, it's getting pretty hairy up there. You know, is there any particular way that you hope this breaks as far as let's look at just the second round? Who are you hoping right now ends up in that four or five matchup? Um, I would say I hope it's Cleveland. And now that I know Randall's gonna be out for sure. Right. Probably another Cleveland, big point just dropped Cleveland today. in New York. Yeah. I probably want Cleveland, New York. Um, I want the Bucks ideally, right? It's um Orlando and Miami. So one of those two teams gets knocked off. It's mm-hmm. Milwaukee and Philly. One of those two teams gets knocked off, right? And then from there, um, you know, then other teams that you don't want to play will knock each other off. So there will be one remaining of the four teams that might give the Celtics some issues, right, in the playoffs. I would say the Bucks, the Magic, the Heat, and the Sixers are the teams that I think could at least, like, push the Celtics a little bit. Um so if it's if it's the Cavs against the Knicks without Randall, I think that's probably best case scenario. Donovan Mitchell doesn't look good right now. He's dealing with a knee thing. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, you know, without Randall, I don't think the Knicks have enough to ha- have enough offense. They'll, they'll make it a grind. They'll definitely make it a grind. But especially if they um, get OG back, they'll make it a grind. Right. Like, yeah, that, is, is that, he expected that to come back? Different. He is, but he also came back and then had more elbow stuff. So I don't. So it, it seems kind of, I mean, Josh Hart the other day made it seem like this is the team we got. Like, I don't he, he's not planning on having OG and then obviously Randall today officially ruled out. So I, I don't know. We'll have to see if he comes back. I do think that makes obviously a difference with with just their talent level. Um, shout out to our guy, Ben Vallis here from first of the floor. Sixers bucks would be just chef's kiss. Awesome. First round matchup. I totally Come on agree. The pod, ben. That's a, uh, that's what I would love to see as well. And also uh, I looked it up here. Uh, Trevor Poulsen bucks equipment manager. Get your shit together, dude. Get your shit together. Trevor Poulsen. All right. We got to go like <laughs> full Stephen a on Trevor Poulsen right now. <laughs> Poor Trevor, this man. man. This like, man's just getting, Put through the coals, man. Do you think he's just Poor sitting there kid. like folding jerseys and he's like, again? Like, what did I do, man? I used extra starch. Like, I made sure I was like fucking there, Nate the no great on Ted Lasso. <laughs> Dude's getting ratioed over yeah, here just Jamie for doing it all over the place. But anyways, it's uh it's gonna be interesting. We'll have to see. I mean, that's honestly gonna be over the next week and a half, two weeks. That's gonna be our biggest storyline on the show, is just kind of looking at what the matchups could be, how they're kind of filtering out so we'll have a lot more on that as we uh go through the next week and a half where there's not going to be hopefully a ton of celtic basketball for us to talk too much about because they'll be like we said jalen brown get some rest missoula stevens please give jalen brown some rest uh and speaking of rest he might start to get that on friday night against the kings so the celtics have a home date with the sacramento kings who are fighting for their playoff lives out west currently the eight seed but it's even tighter at West where realistically they could finish as high as five and as low as nine as there's about two, two and a half games separating uh, everybody in that five to nine range. I think it's maybe about three games actually. Um, But Kings will be in town right now. Jalen Brown is already listed as questionable as is Derek white. Jaden Springer ruled out for that game as of our Thursday recording right now. 
Greg, as we look at this Kings game, officially nothing for the Celtics to play for. Not a damn thing. They can lose every game the rest of the way. Nothing about their fortune in the playoffs will be changed. What do they do from here? Like, what do you? How do you? How do you best approach the the end of this regular season? Because there's still six games left. Ah, man, it's a it's a it's a really tough question. Um, I mean, I think I think it's an easy answer. I think you rest guys, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't. You know, it's the rest versus rust. That mm -hmm. that age old debate is going to come into play if you sit the guys too frequently, especially when you just saw Chris Stapps Porzingis break out of his shooting slump right. after having been on the shelf. And since coming back from the injury, not looking great shooting from beyond the arc. And last night I told you it was going to come around. I said, he yeah. just needed a little bit of time and he definitely came around last night with that three ball. So that's, he was, the awesome last night, by the he, way. he was dude, Porzingis. I think ever since, um, I forget which game it was, maybe the Hawks game or one of the games recently where he, he knew that he just played like shit and he was like, I gotta be better. Yeah. For, for us to win yeah he just got um, bullied and in, in and i think it was the second hawks game and it was yeah, like Capella and, and, and he mentioned it right after the game too right I, and that's what i like about kp too he obviously always takes some um, takes accountability but going up against a king's team that is fighting for playoff seating right now where you have a dirty ass player like your boy sabonis that you have uh shown on the graphic <laughs> i fucking hate sabonis even though he is a double double in. king even though he is lithuanian and i got love for my lithuanian brethren um i I don't want to see the Celtics play anybody real against the Kings. I just like, go ahead, Kings, get a dub, you know, fuck the Lakers over a little bit, get them and yeah. get them a win, keep the Lakers in the nine, 10 game. Um, I don't want to see Porzingis going up against Sabonis, to be honest with you, man, like Sabonis throws bows. He's always just like super physical shoving people from behind. So um, if the Celtics want to practice guarding him because they, he has a similar play style to Jokic, like maybe, but um, I would sit everybody, dude. I think maybe the Knicks game, just just to see where we stack up, just to maybe try some shit out for a half. Maybe mm -hmm. try some shit out for a half guard in Brunson, just see how we do um, against that matchup. But overall, dude, I would not want to play anybody the rest of the way. But I would, at the, I would probably ask the players and say, okay, we have what, six games left? Six games left, yep. Yeah, just say pick two. Pick two games that we're right. going to treat, treat as real games and you're not playing the other four. Yeah, I think it's a little mix of I, I kind of like that idea of like, all right, we're going to pick two games that we're going to play just regular, regular minutes, you know, of course, within caution, and like maybe throw in a few extra Tillman minutes, throw in, you know, uh, maybe O'Shea gets a little extra run in the game that he wouldn't normally and, and and go from there. And then every other game is like three in, three out. Like we're not going to have all six of you on the court at, at one time. It's going to be three in, three out. And you're not playing 35 minutes. You guys are playing. 25 28 minutes and most of the time when we get to the fourth quarter you guys are, are going to be resting uh it, it's going to be an interesting battle because i think the mindset is a very big thing for this team as well and we've seen this dating back to ime which of course missoula was on that staff remember uh what was it the last game of the season of 2022 Celtics could have sat everybody. Now, obviously, there was a little bit something to play for. They could have gone and got the two seed, and it was, do you duck the net smoke? And the Bucks ducked it, and the Celtics said, fuck it. We want it. And they went out, won a game, played all their guys against a Grizzlies team that was resting everybody. And so I think it's part of it what makes it more difficult. It's in this team's DNA to say, if we're healthy, we're playing. We've heard a bunch of them talk about this. Jalen, you're not healthy. You shouldn't be playing. That's the number one thing I want to say. KP, I also feel like you need to get some rest here down the stretch. But that is a big part of their DNA is that if we're healthy, we're going to play. So I think it's going to be a struggle to find out what that balance is. And I think we're going to be on kind of pins and needles. This is my guess. I'm with you. Your plan, I think it sounds great. I don't think that's actually what's going to happen. <laughs> I think we're going to be on pins and needles watching Wizards games the last last day of the season, hoping that you know Jordan Poole doesn't run into the back of Chris Stapp's legs, or that on Friday night Sabonis doesn't go elbows out at the nail and you know jam Drew Holiday in the eyeball or something. Like I I think we're going to be on pins and needles, and I think it's going to get a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, watching some of these last games, knowing that a lot of fans are going to be in the camp of let's just be healthy and get to the finish line. And I don't think that's the DNA. I think that's maybe what they should do, but I don't think that's the DNA of Joe Missoula. And I don't think that's the DNA of a lot of players on this team. So it's going to be a, a very delicate line 
to see to see where it all falls. So I'm preparing myself to to have you know maybe a little Pepto Bismol on the side for some of these games that don't actually matter. And all I'm looking for is body language and how they react to getting off the ground. Pepto Bismol, that's your uh, indigestion medicine of choice. No, I'm I mostly just kind of wing it. I don't really have like an indigestion <laughs> of choice. I just okay. Wait, wait. So did when you say you kind of wing it, it's like you wing it as you're talking, referring to indigestion medicine, or you wing it anytime you have indigestion. So I use Pepto Bismol because I know people are going to understand what I mean by that. Right, 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 right. When I actually have indigestion, I just kind of fight through it. I don't really, I don't really. No medicine. It. No, I'm not. I mean, you know me. I don't take pills. I don't. I'm not a medicine guy. I don't. I just and I'm and I'm for the most part. I feel this is one of those things where who knows if I'm actually right, but I feel vindicated because I'm very rarely sick. And so other than I am starting to get affected by allergies a little bit more often, which is mm -hmm. a living in Texas thing that, you know that I've avoided for 10 years. What my body, my, my immunity is breaking down. <laughs> yeah. It's just a shit's week. <laughs> it's just week, man. 30, 35 years old. The shit gets weak. Um, yep. Well, you're not 35 yet. I'm not going to put not that yet. on. So, so I'm still strong. I'm hey, still you know what, you know what right I, you know, I think would be kind of fun here before we move on to the NBA awards? Just a little get audience get to know you. You mentioned how you are unable to swallow pills, right? Correct. That's just like something that maybe the audience. I don't want to say if it's unable. I probably can if I really focused on it, but I but I don't swallow pills. Yes. What, do, what would you say is like one funny idiosyncrasy about yourself that you you're aware of but maybe you're not like hyper aware of something that you do every day where you're like oh that's definitely a little weird i'm not sure that everybody does this but hmm. it's something that i do and it's it's definitely a little strange it's i can go question. first if you want yeah go first while i think about this i cannot let the microwave go all the way down to zero i always stop the microwave okay. At I've either two seconds yeah. or one or one second, I can't let it go off. Not because I don't like the noise. There's just something about me that like likes always having a little bit of time. And maybe it's because I like using the add thirty seconds button. But th that's kind of my weird thing. As the other day, I was real. I was I was at work and I was like, shit, I really don't let the microwave go off. That's a fucking weird <laughs> thing, man. Like I don't know. The, I remember the last time I let the microwave go all the way to zero. I've got one. So. That that's one I feel like I've heard before. Like I think I think others have that as well. It's just something about that ding. They just, maybe it's just like, you know, that that just irks them or or mm. whatever it is. It just isn't like that ding. Uh, for me, and this is something you 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 definitely know about me is uh, I don't like when cabinets or doors are left open. Mm -hmm. um, it just bothers me. It just bothers like, and it's funny like you know I'm not. I'm not the messiest person, but I'm also not like everything has to be in order. I go crazy. So it's not like I have like an OCD about like things being neat. It's just specifically like if a cabinet <laughs> door or a drawer is not closed, I have to go close it. So if when we were, when open, we were roommates for, for all the listeners, when we were roommates, that's something that I suck at. I am terrible at closing cabinet. I doors. was probably walking behind you, closing them and you didn't <laughs> even notice it. Or I was coming into a room after you. And in fact, the one of the greatest pranks that someone played on me was um, a friend of ours. Uh, shout out to Chris Early. He knows this. And one day he was here visiting. He was in. He was. He was staying with us. Visit, or he wasn't staying with us. But he was in town visiting. And he was over one night when I had work. So I'd gone to bed early, and you know I was asleep. But when he was leaving, at, you know later that night, I was. He knew I was going to be one of the first ones up the next day to to go to work. And before he left our house, he went into the kitchen and opened up every single cabinet before he left. And first thing I did was I walked in. I knew exactly who did it. And before I left for work, I had to close every single cabinet before I left. But it was it was a hell of a good prank. It's a good prank. That's a good prank. Yeah, maybe so, we, yeah. maybe you know, as as we don't have as much basketball to talk about, um, every single podcast still cranking out three pods a week, four pods a week. <laughs> um, the we'll only people in, doing it we'll like we do are first to the floor. Shout out to first to the That's floor, right. cranking out the content like we are. That's a machine, man, and that machine needs to be well oiled and and maintained. Uh, we can do a little bit more of these get to know you segments where he's talking like about how little, we're little weird, slice of life weird, weird coming, human beings coming up in the next uh, next week and a half to two weeks here uh, for today's show. Let's 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 keep going with a little bit of basketball talk here. Oh, uh, where did that go? There we go. Uh, got the right background up now. Let's talk a little bit about NBA awards because why not? It's fun. And like we said, Celtics have already locked up the one seed in the East, one seed overall. Not much else to talk about. And so recently, all there's four guys in the Celtics that are going to have opportunities to win some type of postseason award, all of which are now eligible. They've all hit 65 game requirement. 
let's start at the top. Let's start with the Jays. And, you know, very recently, Jason Tatum, the MVP dream of Jason Tatum is, is likely dead. It is not even likely dead. It's dead. It, Can I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. Do you think Jason Tatum will ever win an MVP? I think if I had to bet just straight up, yes or no, I'd say no, just because I think it's really fucking hard. Um, but I think, I mean, he's he's going to be probably in the top five, which I think he was top six and then top five last year. He'll be top five again this year, likely. So it's going to be at least, let's just say, three straight years of being in the top six. So I think he's going to be consistently in the conversation. So to say he's never going to win, I think would be... Kind of, I, think, kind of I think he's going to win it in the next two years because I think Wemby's going to get like <laughs> freaking like six or seven straight. Wemby's coming, man. Wemby's coming. Almost dropping a quadruple double the other night. Block Jokic four times. Uh, Jokic is just shaking his head. He was like, what the hell do you want me to do, man? I, I also heard today, or maybe I read this. Um, I think Jokic had either three or four dunks in that game. Jokic doesn't dunk the ball. He almost never dunks it. And I think that was like the most dunks he's had in a game in like two years or something. And it was because every time he tried to shoot the ball any other way with uh, one of them was great where he does like kind of the off the wrong foot, slow delayed release. And Wemby just switched which hand he was defending him with and then blocked it with the other one on the delay. It was, <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was like, maybe, it's maybe the, the Jokic was destined stuff. to dominate until like, like Wemby is the chosen one. Wemby's the chosen one that can stop Jokic. Cause we, we keep talking about, there is no answer. Like you don't stop Nikola Jokic. There is no way. And I think Jokic still had like 40 points. In this yeah, game yeah, or, yeah. Or he, he's still crazy. the best player on the court. Yeah. Yeah. But give Wemby a little bit of time, get some, get some bulk on him that, you know, maybe that's going to be uh, the guy who can finally stop Jokic. So I think back to your Tatum question, I think it's just really hard to to win an MVP. However, the more I did think about, because I was thinking about this the other day as well, if he's ever going to be an all time, not just Celtic, but like all time NBA guy, he probably does need to win at least one at some point. Like Kobe only has one, right? Shaq only has one. Like I, and I don't know that Tatum's going to be in that LeBron, MJ, whatever. It doesn't it doesn't need to be. But I'm my point just being, if he's going to be a top twenty guy of all time, and this is thinking far down the road he's probably gonna have to win one at some point because all those guys do have at least one like you're, you're i yeah. doubt he's you're gonna, he's gonna win at least fight. one regular season mvp or he's gotta win like three straight finals or three finals Something in five like years that. and have multiple finals mvps mm -hmm. um for him to be in like the top 20 of all time discussion um which right. i i don't think is out of the question for tatum but it needs to happen soon right if because as we said, Wemby's here, Jokic is here. There's all these guys. Embiid, you know, is is still going to be at the top of his game mm -hmm. another couple of years. Ants, Luca, Luca's going to get Luke, more help Luca. probably at some point. Like, Luca looks good, man. I've been watching a lot great. of Mavs. I I was giving Luca a lot of shit. Earlier we, we were wrong the on the Mavs. We were wrong. I mean, they've they've revamped their team in different ways, but we were wrong. And part of we it's very just, wrong. We 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 were also betting on Kyrie. They're playing not being differently, normal. Though, man. Kyrie's like, been it, normal this year. If they were playing the way that they had always played. Mm -hmm. then we would have been right. They made changes. You know, they yeah. made a lot of changes to their style. Their tempo is so much faster. They're playing with a lot more pace. Lucas still dominates the ball, but he's getting off the ball a little bit more willingly, um, make a quick, making quicker decisions. He's in better shape, man. Yeah. Last year, he was just kind of chubby. Like when you look at him, he's still not in like the best shape, but he's definitely, right. when you look at him, you're like, oh no, he looks like he's ready for the playoffs. And, and, and they named that Derek Lively pick. I really enjoyed watching Derek mm -hmm. Lively. Gafford looks good for them. PJ Washington dude. looks good for them. Yeah, they did a hell of a job, man. And like, I mean, a lot of this hinged on Kyrie just having a stable year and he's had a stable year. And like, dude, that lefty, I still think about that lefty hook shot he hit like <laughs> two, three weeks ago. That was one of the craziest shots I, I've ever seen. I, I don't know what to make. I mean, sweet. this is why, like, as crazy as I think it is that he he's he's every Hooper's favorite Hooper, right? Or the respected Hooper. I don't know. I don't know how you want to phrase that. And everyone's like, who would you take on the last second shot? Everyone says Kyrie. Like that shot right there, I guess, is like, I can't argue with it. Like, I can't think of who else. You know, like, imagine if Kyrie was 6'6". Six, six. He would just be freaking unstoppable. He'd he's like 6'2", man. Does all the shit He'd at 6'2". Uh, all right, go back to Tatum. Let, let's talk about Tatum here for a second. I think so. Tim Bontemps for ESPN did the MVP straw poll. He came out in fifth. So that's like I said, that's likely where he's going to land. As I mentioned on a, a, our fact or fiction show, Brunson came in sixth. I think Brunson's on his heel. So this becomes, I think also the NBA first team debate. Is it going to be Jalen? Is it going to be Tatum? You know, I think those are going to mirror each other, but I, I think when you look at postseason awards for Jason Tatum, he's a stone cold lock at worst. He's a second team, all NBA this guy yeah. this year and should be first team. We agree on that. Absolutely. Right? 
Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I think from there, because that's that that's where Tatum's at. That's the level that he lives in. Then it becomes Jalen Brown. And Jalen Brown, I think when you look at all NBA, I think for a portion of the season, it was like, yeah, Jalen Brown's going to be an all-star, probably not going to make all NBA. At least it felt like that way over the last, you know, whatever it is, 20, well, the, 25 well, well, games. Bef- you before you go over that, I don't even think it was a lock. He was going to make the all-star team. I think there were a, a certain lot of, point. Yeah. Yeah. I think mean, there were a lot of people that were like, yeah, Jalen Brown's not really looking that great. Like even the, you know, Bill Simmons is of the world, the Zach Lowe's of the world. When that same week, they both like released podcasts questioning Jalen Brown and his play with the Celtics. And I'm sitting there like, I feel like Jalen's actually playing pretty good. Um, yeah. and, and it just took a while for everyone to see that Jalen was improved, was making better decisions. And then Jalen had to do it for an extended period of time, right? I thought he was playing well when he was getting unfairly criticized earlier in the season, but he wasn't as consistent as he's been, especially on the defensive side of the ball. So he went from maybe is he an all-star this year to, oh, Jalen Brown's definitely an all-star to, yeah, he's an all-star, but is he all NBA to, oh, he's definitely all NBA. Yeah, and that that's kind of where I'm at right now with Jalen Brown is is I think over I'd, I'd have to try to figure out where the line of demarcation is, but over the last 20, 25 games, I think he's been the Celtics' best player. Like I like I as as good as Tatum has been, like I like I think Tatum is still the best player. But I think it's a, it's at least an argument is is the whole point of it, right? Is that Jalen Brown has been that good? It's been you the know, most from. That's fair. Maybe, maybe this is once again important, impactful, valuable. We can we can argue which adjective best describes which one of them, and we can probably make a case on on either side of it. But I think okay, he, he's right been now, the team's alpha. It's a good way to put it. Tone setter, you know, something. Yeah, yeah. I like yeah. I like that. So I think right now, I don't know if it's going to be because I think there's a lot of cans, especially where you don't have to be worrying about position this year. But I think it's a pretty. I I would be shocked if Jalen's not second or third team. I don't know which team. It's going to end up being my guess would be third team, but I think there's absolutely a case for him for for second team. But I'm going to be pretty shocked if he doesn't end up on an all NBA team, which to your point, there was questions about him being an all star to now being feeling like one of the 10 to 11 guys that are locks for all NBA teams. That just speaks volumes about the season that Jalen Brown has had. Yeah, and I think, you know, definitely on NBA, but I also wanted to pull up a clip here from after last night's game. Al Horford was speaking glowingly about Jalen Brown and his um, ability to make the all-defensive team. So I want to pull that up really quickly and just play this quick clip from last night's uh, post game where Al Horford uh, makes a case for Jalen Brown to be first-team all-defense. Jalen has said it was a goal of his to make the all-defense team this season, and just – how much growth have you seen from him on that end? And, and what does him taking on those challenges do for the rest of the group? Uh, well, it's, it inspires the rest of us um, because uh, he does a lot on the offensive end and then he wants the responsibility on the defensive end. And a lot of people say they may want those challenges, but he's facing all types of different players. He's guarding Steph Curry. He's guarding Zion, you know, just different guys uh, that he has to match up against. And, um, you know, just being very unbiased, very clear, like you can, he's first team all defense. Like, you know, like there's just no, you know, you, you look at what he's doing individually and the impact that he has on the defensive end. Um, it's, you know, we're one of the best defenses in the league, have the best record. Um, he, he deserves to be in that position. You're on mute, Will. Um, but First, yeah, I mean, we'll <laughs> I, just go ahead. Say, I love Al. I love that Al's. Just, I was going to say, Al's... I was going to say that that's sponsored by Carmax. <laughs> Wait, why would you say that? Is that was that on the screen? No, look, look, look at his look at Al's lips. They're so shiny. <laughs> OK, that went over <laughs> that went over my head. I got you. I got you, dude. I, I love the elder statesman. Al. I love it, man. I'm. You know, I remember at one point we we just talked earlier about uh, when we used to live together. And we were watching the first version of Al Horford, and I remember we were like, "Man, is Al Horford one of our like five favorite Celtics of all time?" I, I've I've since had to rethink that as the growth of obviously Tatum and Brown has probably ascended that. But he's beloved, man. He's beloved. Al's beloved. But back to your point here. Oh no, I mean, just like hearing that clip from from Al Horford campaigning for Jalen Brown to be all defense. I think when you when you start to hear players 
on your team campaigning for for you to get recognized for the sacrifices that you've made and to to say you know what Marcus Smart has left and as a result I am now going to be the one to step up and take on those those assignments I want the smoke I want the responsibility that's what makes a season like this, when we were talking about earlier, what are we going to look back on from the season 10 years ago? It's the Jalen Brown um, entry into the all defense discussion and entry into the, is he the Celtics best player yeah. discussion entry into the, Oh, he's definitely an all defensive candidate. So I think the all defensive team and the potential for the Celtics is kind of fascinating because there's three guys with cases. So I think it's Jalen Brown, who we just talked about, obviously drew holiday. And I think Derek white, I think those are the three guys that have potential to make an all defensive team. Now we have to remember it's only 10 spots and I'll be honest. I'm probably ill-equipped to, to give you a full list of who I think is going to make it and not make it because I just don't watch other teams as much as I watch the Celtics, but just kind of thinking through general narratives and through obviously some of my own eyes of, of, of what I've uh, of what I've watched this year. There's three guys in the Celtics. Not all three of them are going to make this these 10 slots here for all defense. Definitely one. I think maybe two of them make it, but that's that's about it. And, you know, thinking about spots that are probably already wrapped up, just, just name it a couple. Here. Let me know if there's anyone that you would either disagree with or add to this list. Rudy Gobert, Wemby, Herb Jones, Alex Caruso, Jalen Suggs. That's five. And then I've got four guys with question marks that I would say are going to be at least in this conversation. Anthony Davis, Bam Adebayo, Jalen McDaniels, KCP. Uh, say say the second team again. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is even based on team. This is just names that I think are okay. going to make one of the two teams. So I think the guys that are definitely making one of these two teams, Gobert, Wemby, Herb Jones, Caruso, and Suggs. I think those are five guys that are. Do you think Caruso is definitely going to be on the team? I do, man. I mean, he's he, such a role I mean, he, player, though. He is, but I mean, listen, Bulls, like you said, the Bulls are not worried about them in the playoffs. Part of the reason that they're even somewhat like they're in a million clutch games. I think they're, you're, they're, you know, I think the world of Caruso. Right. But, and, and I feel like just the way that he's talked about in the you know nba spectrum like i just think he's gonna get enough love that that he okay maybe he's not a lot maybe he's one of the question marks and this is kind of the playing point 28 here. minutes a game yeah i mean that's not that's not nothing it's not like he, he's not jonathan isaac love. like jonathan isaac deserves a shout out but he's not gonna make because he plays like 15 minutes a game or 18 yeah. minutes a game you know For what sure. i mean yeah so I, I think there's there's difference to that but maybe he's in that question mark category then so then you have gobert wemby Herb Jones and Suggs. I think those are four kind of undisputable locks mm -hmm. that are going to make the all defensive team. Yeah. So then you would have Caruso, Anthony Davis, Bam, McDaniels, KCP, and then you got three Celtics. And I'm sure I'm over. There's there's someone I'm missing that's that isn't that I haven't listed out here yet. Because like I said, I don't think I'm the best person to make an all defensive. You know, here's my list of who I think it would be because I just watched more Celtics than mm -hmm. I do anything else. So I'm going to be very right. biased. Right. Yeah. But trying to figure out is there room for two guys out of those three Celtics and who would it be? I think is is pretty difficult. Do you know if all defensive teams are still positioned? I believe it's positionless, but I'm gonna I'm gonna double check that right now. Okay, because I think that that would adjust how I'm feeling about about this discussion. But I think to me, I'm partial to Bam definitely being on second team all defense. Um, I would probably go if it's front court back court. I'd probably go when so usually so real quick. So traditionally, it is two. Two guard spots, two forward spots, and a center spot. I don't. I'm trying to figure out if that's been updated for this season. So okay, I'll, I'll keep ben researching that. Ben, ben, if you're still yeah. there, you know the answer to that. But okay, so if it's a center first team, I probably go Gobert. You know, best defense in mm -hmm. the league. He's he deserves it. I think he deserves first team all defense. So that puts Wemby on your second team. I think you can slot. You can make an argument for both Bam and AD to be in the forward spots, right? So you could mm -hmm. you could put both of them. Um, as forwards on one of the two teams, Herb Jones, I think you could make an argument could be to be a guard or a forward, depending on, I think like Suggs and Caruso are like more, um, stereotypical guards, right? Um, Derek white stereotypical guard. So I think those guys are going to be in there. I think it's kind of like, I have an update. Okay. It is, it's positionless. 
So it's that is one of the, yes. Oh man, that change that changes everything. Right, that makes it really difficult because now it's like you're, you're getting Wemby, you're getting Gobert. You don't got to split if they're a power forward right. or not. So I mean, okay, so if, if, if that's the case, I mean, it's probably really if you think about like just like impact on the game. First team would probably be mostly big men. Mm-hmm. Right, it'd be Wemby, it'd be Gobert, it'd be AD, it'd be Bam. I think all four of those guys probably deserve a spot on the first team on defense because they're also great because of both the Heat and the Lakers not necessarily playing up to par. Maybe you make an argument that those guys go into second team all defense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you're factoring in team success, does Caruso even get a look right. there? You know what I mean? I think Herb Jones, Jaden McDaniels, two guys that I would probably have, like those are probably two of my favorite wing defenders in the league. Um, love what Jaden McDaniels can do. Herb Jones has been pretty special on the defensive side of the ball too. So, you know, I'm kind of talking it through right now. I'd probably go Herb Jones, McDaniels, Wemby, Gobert, and I don't take your pick on that last spot, man. Maybe Suggs. I, mean, I was gonna say we got Suggs. We got any of the Celtics guys. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's really tough. So like, let's look at it from a Celtics perspective. Like I said, I, there's no chance you're getting three guys on this out of these ten spots. They're not getting three guys, and I don't think they should. They shouldn't get get three spots out of ten. That's that's a you, you'd have to be like you know the 85 bears defense equivalent in football or some sh- or some right, shit like right. that right yeah so 2005 pistons yeah so let's let's rank the three guys who do you think out of those three out of jb drew and d white who's most likely to make a, an all defensive team i feel like it would be Derek white that's my answer as well he has more of the highlight plays i think jalen's candidacy is more about like the mindset and the mentality and taking some of the, the some of the media quotes are helping him, I think, build build a momentum of like, I want to guard this guy. And then obviously the, the Al quote that you just played, like, mm-hmm. I think he, he, not to say that his defensive case isn't true, but I think he's building momentum at the right time mm-hmm. with quotes that are helping to to build upon the narrative of of what he's actually done on the court. Right. So I think it would be Derek White. I think Derek White has been the most solid defender narrative wise. I think it's Drew Holiday just because he came in and like the the quotes that we talked about on the Draymond show and, you know, his the unleashing of Drew Holiday as this like Ed Reed type defender on the defensive side of the ball where he's just kind of freelancing, playing in the middle of that zone, um, guarding big men, the versatility that you're seeing out of Drew Holiday, the switch that he had to make to come into this team to go from the primary on ball defender to just like the guy who's unleashed in 10 different ways over 10 different possessions, you know, like, yeah. Like th- that's where the argument is for Drew Holiday and just like the reputation around the league, Drew Holiday. Like when you're making the Caruso argument, I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it. I think Caruso's awesome. I think he definitely is one of the best defenders in the league. But in terms of reputation, I think Drew Holiday still probably has like a better reputation as a defender yeah. than Caruso, I, you know? I think so too. It's just like it's it's because there's so many candidates that almost hurt you, right? Whereas Caruso right, right. is kind of more of a, a lone wolf. But like I think for me, like Holiday. I think he should be on the team because we, we talked about it. You know, we talked about it all throughout the season. He hasn't had to be like, hey, I'm the guy on ball, especially when we were talking about the Draymond, you know, interview. I'm not on the ball. He's he's doing nine different things, right? He's everywhere. And then when he needs to be on ball and, you know, yeah, DeJounte Murray made that shot, but we talked about how he got stripped before. He played great defense when it was just him and DeJounte in the open court. DeJounte is a great athlete, made a really tough shot to win that game. Like he can still be that guy that when you're like, hey, man, we need someone to go get us a stop. It's probably Drew Holiday that you're going to go send out in that moment. And when you add in the fact that I bet on him at the beginning of the season at plus 450, I pre- I really think that Drew Holiday should be on this all defensive <laughs> team so that I can start gambling again because your boy's I bank account. I can't gamble is- anymore, bro. I am out on gambling. I'm full I've got, Kramer. I've got going to Jerry asking him, asking him to make the bet for me because I can't gamble. Um, I can't, I, I can't do it anymore, man. Um, I've got, you have, Greg, I've got two future bets that are, that are, that won't hit until the end of the season. And I'm, I haven't, I, I'm, I'm down to, let's see, I'm down to a small amount. Let's just say that. I'm not going to say how much I have. Left. It's, I have it's not literally enough. zero, I have zero it's, it's dollars in enough. my betting account. Yeah. I don't have enough to place a, a real bet. Uh, but I've got the Celtics to win the NBA championship is plus 400. And I've got Drew Holiday to make an all-defensive team at plus 450. Those are my future bets that I need to hit 
if your boy wants to start gambling again. So it's all or nothing, baby. I need Drew Holiday on that all defensive team so I can come into a little bit of cheddar. As a soon to be dad, I have to retire the gambling. No more gambling slips for me. I got to save that money. Do you, do you know how much expensive daycare is, bro? Uh, I've been hearing about it. I know that it's uh, I know it's not cheap. On like the cheap end of things, it's like 20 grand for, for a year. Yeah, it's not ideal. That's uh, a that's tough, money. man. And that's like so, for a daycare that you're like, OK, like, I guess I could send my kid here. It's not right. for a daycare where you're like, oh, my kid is set. You know, it's like, so mm, what you what you could so, like, it could have some germs. Here's <laughs> the thing, though. But if you were to grab the Celtics at plus 400 to win the NBA championship and you were to put down a couple hundred bucks, you know, that's the other way to look at it. Maybe that did you put a couple hundred bucks on it. No, I did not. But I'm just saying, <laughs> if you had gone above and beyond the amount that I put, I put 50 bucks on it. But if hey. you had gone above and beyond that amount, maybe that pays for your child care. So I'm just, I'm trying to be the devil on your shoulder that says no. maybe you can look at this as an investment. I mean, is it that much different than Bitcoin? I don't know. Who's to say? Take the gamble, Greg. No, I'm just kidding. Do do what feels right. That's will, I, don't, will, I don't want to be responsible for this. I, no, I was, no, okay, uh, okay. Let, let, let's be real. Let's be real, man. You are like pure shot and Freud. You love when I lose bets. You like take this weird pleasure in my pain of losing bets. Yeah, but now but that it's gonna it's like, you're your my son. best friend. It's not fun. You're my best friend, but it's like kind of fucked up. Well, here's the thing, because I I, I think it's fun when there's a little bit of tension. Like, I don't love when it's like, hey, let's all go out and watch the game. And, like, I don't have a stake in it. And everyone's a UConn fan. I kind of want to root for Purdue. Like, I kind of want to be like, all right, let's let's have a little bit of, of back and forth here. Like, it's just there's there's times where you're all together on it. And there's times where it's fun to have a little bit of back and yeah. forth. But now yeah. that this would affect your your kid. Uh, yeah, now it's not fun anymore. So now it's now it's way less fun to see you lose a bet. But when you lose a bet where you hedge in a bet to not lose and you lose both, come on, man. That's that, that that's high quality entertainment. The Greg special. Yeah, of course. The Greg special. The Greg special. But uh yo, appreciate everybody that has been uh tuning in with us here on these live streams. Um, as we said, we're gonna keep doing them all the way throughout the playoffs. So 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central. We're going to be rocking it here. So make sure you are following us on YouTube. Make sure you're following us on Twitter. We will have plenty of coverage for you guys. Six games left. We're going to give you a little slice of life. We're going to tell you a little bit more about us as we go down Can the I stretch here. Thing, it? Get set up. Of course. What you got here, man? So I don't know if you were following in the chat. First of all, shout out to the chat. Um, Ben Vallis, he said earlier when we were showing the, the out clip, he said, I love how you can hear someone whistling in the background of the clip. Just the pure joy of 60 wins. And my question to the chat was, who do you think is the most likely to be the whistler on the team? Now, I don't know. Don't look at the chat. I don't know if you've seen the chat already, but I, who would, who would you know. say? Who would you say? Uh, the well, the first name, the I'm going to say it's O'Shea Brissett. Okay. I think that yeah. I think that's a pretty good candidate. O'Shea Brissett is a pretty good candidate. Yeah, I the, feel like he's just like skipping through. He's got his camcorder. He's he's filming O'Brissy TV. You know, like I could, you know, that, that guy seems to enjoy life, right? I, I just feel like O'Shea is a guy that would be very content with you know being where he's at in Boston. He's making content and he's, he's just digging it. This was Ben's answer. KP easily. <laughs> I agree. I agree because KP kind of has that like smirk, the ne the never ending smirk on his face, the indelible smirk where he's just like always kind of like seemingly up to something. I think that's why him and Jalen get along so well is they, well, that's why he makes a better bond villain than the next James Bond. That's, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. Uh, I'm trying to think like, I feel like Grant in the past was definitely a whistler, but he was one of those annoying whistlers where he would like, every, like the moment you heard the whistle, you just like, God damn it. Grant's here again. It's like the fucking Omar whistle. Like, you know, like but, annoying enough to get traded. Like annoying enough to get traded. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else who would be a whistler. Who do you think is the I mean Luke? Luke I think I think Luke's a, a candidate for this as well. Luke Cornett would be who's the least likely whistler? Least likely. Uh, I'd say like Drew Holiday, probably. I could see Drew being a whistler. I'm going Peyton. I feel I feel like Peyton. Yeah, Pey Peyton's a good one. He's yeah. Peyton's too cool for it. He's he's yeah, not he's, he's cool. not he's not doing that. Peyton Peyton's got like his own little swagger about him. He's like nah nah nah. He's yeah he's he's that guy. That, like everyone else is down to do it and know that you're just like kind of being foolish. And Peyton's like nah, I'm good. I'm yeah, I'm I'm, I'm I'm cool. I'm cool with that. I think Luke is probably most likely to uh, be singing in the shower. Yeah. I mean, Luke's the goofiest dude in the team. He's like right. he's 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 the goofiest, ge most genuine dude. So I think he would he would be a candidate for for any of these uh, 
or for anything that we're talking about right now. So I think he's up there, man. But I don't know. We'll maybe we'll find out. Let us know out there. Can you figure out who is the Celtics whistler in the Al Horford clip? <laughs> can we can we crack this as we have six games to go? Uh, we'll figure it out. Hopefully, we'll see what we can do. We'll do some investigating. Greg, as always, man, it has been a pleasure. We will be back on uh, recording on Sunday, so we will have some more for you. Celtics have a game on Sunday as well against Portland, so TBD on what time we have that uh, podcast up on YouTube and out, but be on the lookout for it. We will have some more coverage for you, and we'll catch everybody later. Enjoy your weekend. Peace. Till I hit the floor Every time I get this high It's you I find It don't take much no more Until I met your door Cool, baby, what can I say? You got me on the floor, you know I came to play. I know I shouldn't, but you seem to take my pain away. And every time I score, Jason Tatum fade away. I close my eyes and I'm floating your river. 